Hello everyone. Welcome to the webinar series on building resilient cities. This is an initiative of the Urban Resilience Unit. The unit is established in collaboration with 100 resilient cities pioneered by the Rockefeller Foundation and the National Institute of Urban Affairs for promoting and supporting the development of resilient cities across India. My name is Vaishnavi and I have my colleague Ashali here. We'll be co-moderating the webinar today. Our seg second webinar, the series is on remote sensing of surface urban heat island progresses and prospects. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Professor Kao Weng, who is the director of the Center for Urban and Environmental Change and a professor of geography at Indiana State University. Professor Weng is currently the lead of Group of Earth Observation, Global Urban Observation and Information Initiative and an editor-in-chief of ISPRS Journal of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. A very warm welcome uh, to you, Professor. Uh, today, uh, Professor Weng will be presenting different methodologies to generate uh, consistent land surface temperature data and the use of satellite-derived land surface temperature data to highlight surface urban heat islands. Thank you for the introduction. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> in my talk, with the remote sensing of surface urban heat island, I would like to introduce three questions today. Okay, first let's start to talk about what is urban heat island? What is the surface urban heat island? So uh, as we know that urbanization is has been going on for a, a few uh, centuries and urbanization is happening and as accelerating worldwide. And in recent years, we, according to United Nations, uh, the urban population has over half of the the uh, the, uh, the global inhabitants. That means that more than half of the people living in the urban areas. So during the urbanization process, there are a number of factors that change the local climate. And especially in the surface radiations, in the wind turbines, and in the humidities, and also the anthropogenic heat release. These factors combined together create urban heat islands, which means that the temperatures in the urban areas is higher than the surrounding rural areas. And in traditionally, we normally we detect these urban heat islands using air temperature. So by comparing the air temperatures at a local station in urban areas, and also in the nearby uh, meteorological stations in the rural areas, we compare the air temperature difference between these two stations and determine the magnitude of urban heat islands. However, these, uh, these can also be uh, compared, the, the temperatures can also be compared by looking at the surface temperatures in the rural area and the surface temperature in the urban areas. So these comparisons will allow us to examine something called surface urban heat islands. So surface urban heat islands, especially, okay, study the land surface temperature, of course. And the surface urban heat islands, although can be, can be measured by the instruments, uh, for example, instruments in the meteorological stations at uh, using uh, using the uh, in-situ observation, but can also observe by airborne and satellite-borne sensors. So these sensors detect the thermal heat, and, and then we can transfer this thermal heat into surface urban temperatures. So this length surface temperature comparison then will allow us to, to see the magnitude of urban heat islands. By comparing to the atmospheric urban heat islands, where we compare air temperatures in rural and urban areas, surface urban heat island has a little bit distinctive 
characteristics. One of the, the major difference between the surface of Irving Heat Island and the atmospheric surface of Irving Heat Island is that during the daytime, we see a higher magnitudes in surface of Irving Heat Islands. While during nighttime, atmospheric Irving Heat Islands has a, has a higher magnitudes normally. So this is due to the interactions between the land surface and the the atmospheres. So in this in these uh, lectures, my focus will be on the surface of the islands. So we now know that the land surface temperature is a essential element, essential parameters to measure surface of the islands. However, we can use this land surface temperature for many purposes. For example, we can use this to study surface energy balance in the urban areas, and moistures, evapor transpirations, and climate change at different scales. And further, we can use this land surface temperature to study heat hazards, for example, like heat wave. And we can examine this use uh, surface urban heat island in combined with other environmental biophysical variables to study uh, the environmental disease and energy consumption from buildings, energy consumption from highways, for example. So land surface temperature has been using for many purposes in global climate change, in hydrological cycles. So my focus now will be study land surface temperatures. So there are four things we were talking about that with remotely sense land surface temperature to study surface of urban heat islands. The second thing is to study surface of urban heat island evolutions and modeling their change over time. As we know that urban heat island not only have the, the magnitude between the urban area and the rural area, but also have different different shape and, and different structures because of the different city has a different the build structures. So accordingly, surface urban heat island also have different shape and structures. And we can use land surface temperature to study how these surface urban heat island change over the time. The third thing is to study mitigation and urban planning. The finally, we can also use the land surface temperature to build up the whole historical trend since the land surface temperature from satellite has been there for several decades. For example, Landsat was the first launch in 1972. So accordingly, we can use this land surface temperature for several decades to study how land surface temperature changes over time and how surface urban heat island changes over time. This is an example that uses use Lensat ETM Enhanced Semantic Mapper Plus sensor to examine land surface temperature change uh, the pattern, geographical patterns in the city of Indianapolis where I live. I'm happy to let you know that this job was first conducted by, by uh, my uh, former students, Dr. Ranjasika, and now your colleague. And so we were on this process. And so this is, a, as you can see that to the left of the figure panels, you can see this uh, contour map to indicate that different temperatures at different location of the, the cities, the, the city. And to the right side, we can model this, use different colors to indicate where is the surface urban heat island is located, what is the shape, and how the structures is. And further, if we use 
like meteorological satellite, for example, like geostationary satellite, like GOES, and we can examine how these land surface temperatures can polar variations. A difference between the Landsat uh, image and the geostationary satellite is that the Landsat has a higher spatial resolutions, but they will they will <clears throat> take longer to revisit the same location. So in so the Landsat will come back in the same location every 16 days, every 16 days. So for example, if Landsat visit my cities today, so the next visit to my city will be 16 days later. So this may create problems because when satellite pass over my cities, and my city may be cloudy, may be raining. So in this way that it will be difficult to get land surface temperatures. However, with geostationary satellites, that although the spatial resolution is quite coarse, however, every day they have a lot of our images. For example, like ghost images, we have a, every between to half hour we can have images. So this will allow us to think differently if we can combine this high spatial resolution of lens imagery and the lower spatial resolution but high temporal resolution of geostationary satellite imagery. So our first thinking is that how to how to combine this modest image which has a very higher temporal resolution. Every day has two images. And the length set TM image, which has a higher spatial resolution, but every 16 days to come back the same locations. So our first thinking is that to combine these two images to predict a daily length of the temperature at 120 meter resolutions. That 120 meter resolution equivalent to equivalent to a city block in the United States. So as you can see that currently all those operational satellites in the space and can be either be very high spatial resolutions, for example, like the the Lensat TM ETM plus and and the, the uh, TIRS from Lensat 8, which is operational. So they all have these thermal bands. Uh, from 60 to 120 meter resolutions, and including these ester imageries. However, the refractive band is a little bit higher. The temporal resolution is every 16 days. But if you look look at the images by MODIS AVHRR goes, and these images has a very high temporal resolutions. Okay, so one to two images, two images, and every 15 minutes of images. But their spatial resolution is quite high. It's quite coarse. So one kilometers, one kilometers, five kilometers. So that's why we need to develop some kind of methodologies to combine these two types of length surface temperature images. So in these studies, we develop a mechanism to combine them together. So the basic thinking is that the the modis images at the time location one, two, three, four, they all available. And so, however, the length set imagery is only at the time one and time two available. We do not have the length set imagery at time two and time three. So we we want to use the modis imagery between these one and four to develop a some kind of the temporal change uh, train. And using these temporal change trains to apply to lens set imagery so that we will be able to produce the lens set imagery at time two and time three. And we call this algorithm called spatially, spatial temporal additive data fusion algorithm for temperature mapping. And this 
the follow chart to show how we process these uh, algorithms. So, as you can see here, in the first row of the images, the A images here, to show all of those observed modest length surface temperatures. And so these images has a very coarse resolutions. This is so in the city of Los Angeles in the United States. And in the second row, you will see that this is a predicted image of lens surface temperatures. So they have higher resolutions. In the third row, here is observed lens surface temperatures. So we can compare this row B and row C and see our predictions how well use this algorithm. We call this a, a SAFA, a SAFA algorithms. And when we do this together plot between the observed and the predict length surface temperatures, we can see that our predictions is quite well. So this comparison to indicate that our prediction and observation producing the mean absolute difference or under these two degrees, okay, under two degrees, that is by scientific standard is acceptable. Uh, prediction. So this is our first examples here, okay, to use a data fusion can buy high spatial resolution lens images and high temporal resolution modis image to produce 120 meter lens surface temperatures uh, using Los Angeles as examples. The second example I want to show is how to generate consistent lens surface temperature from irregularly spaced lens, lens set imageries. So as we know that I mentioned earlier, the lens surface temperatures, okay, when satellite fly over the specific city, so the city may be under cloudy skies, may be raining, may be cloudy, so we won't be able to get the length of the temperature at the group, uh, what do you call, uh, you know, imageries. And so in this way that we had to consider how to get the, the images under these cloudy skies. And another consideration would be that how to, how to consider our, uh, the, the algorithms if we produce an algorithm, how to take into account any city, any locations due to disturbing events, for example, like deforestations or desertifications, urbanizations, and this this kind of land surface uh, phenomena may change land surface temperature significantly. So in this way that we want to consider a new algorithm here to produce this. So use the example of Beijing, China as a study area. We examine how this lens surface temperature can be derived from irregularly spaced lens set imagery. And you can see that this is the Beijing area. And you can also see at the bottom here, okay, has 11 stations, meteorological stations nearby Beijing. And so this, this is important because Beijing has been developed very quickly in terms of lane, uh, urban expansions since the 1980s. So we first go through different kind of data pre-processing, for example, like geometry processing, cloud uh, considerations, and also the M MS30 considerations, emissivity considerations, in order to get length surface temperature for each day. And after we get this length surface temperature for each day, we stack this length surface temperature together to become length surface temperature time series. So this time series, and we call this a uh, uh, as you can see that each of these dark here, this is a, to showing the length of the temperature at any piece of locations. So to become time series. 
So if we have 30 year, 40 year of plain surface temperatures, then this step will be very, very thick. Okay. So the second step right here is the model fittings. So we fit the annual cycle, temperature cycles to this time series in order to derive the length surface temperature models. So to understand how length surface temperature change, uh, seasonal changes, yearly changes, and long-term changes in a study areas. So eventually we can get uh, important parameters, for example, like mean surface temperatures, like yearly amplitude, and, uh, and other, uh, you know, like heat lag, okay, all these kind of parameters. So the algorithms here we develop, okay, basically go through this process, okay. So the first process is that stack all these images together, unevenly distributed images together. And then, and then we, and then we remove those outliers and constrain the surface reflectance and length surface temperature within the set ranges. In this way, that the model will be more robust because of some of those outliers, for example, the temperature is extremely cold or extremely hot, they're going to impair the model performance. So the next thing would be that we divided the whole time series into stationary segments. And this, in this way that the effect of disturbing event may be, may be minimized. And the next thing, as I mentioned, is a model of heating. So that in this way that we can, can derive the annual temperature cycle models and the train variation data model. So to, to solve the, the interannual changes. And after these modelings, we have those residuals, model residuals. So these residuals, and they will be modeled by uh, another uh, technique. We call this a Gaussian process of regressions to show how these changes, okay, we, we seen, uh, we, we seen this, uh, temporal, uh, the time series. And eventually we add these three models together to become the ATC, which is the annual temperature cycle, and the train component and daily specific anomaly modeling by Gaussian process regressions. As you can see that here, to select one of the stations, weather station S1 in Beijing, we can see that different uh, frequency of this uh, uh, Gaussian process modeling called GPR, how this model performance. So eventually we decided to select one harmony frequency which has uh, the highest uh, uh, modeling, uh, modeling uh, accuracy. So when we put them all these together and the models uh, can produce this length surface temperature over time. So these figures here in the middle to show comparison between satellite derived length of temperature and the station measured length of temperatures. So the model of the predictions in, in red colors and the originals in blue colors. So this one, okay, by comparison this one, we see that the errors between the satellite length of temperatures is between 1.8 to 2.8 Kelvin, with a mean error of 2.3 Kelvin. And so this is so one station of comparisons. And so the next thing would be the how to look at the, our model performance. So the length surface temperature model by our algorithm called Delta, and to compare to the weather stations. So this one, okay, to show the comparison of between delta algorithm and weather stations. So these, these so one stations are here. Okay, you can see that all these data are here. So the to show a mean error of 3.5 k. 
So these predictions is reasonable, okay? Thinking that because the model error, including not only the satellite compared to the local stations, but also the satellite compared to the model performance. And so with these models, we essentially, we can produce every day, every day length surface temperature at 120 meter resolutions. This, in this way, we can avoid a lot of our issues of due to cloudy skies, snows, and uh, rainings, so that we can have every type of temperatures. The temperature you see here is in year 2000. So every month of 15, 15 days, so this length of temperature in Beijing in year 2000. So with these data, we basically, we can compare the urban areas, the length of temperature, and the rural areas, length of temperature. And in this way that we can calculate the urban heat island intensity, or we say magnitude in Beijing, we found that this intensity increased from 1982 to 2011. This over 30 years, the urban heat islands ranging from 3.3 to 5.3 kilowatts. So our study is quite sense, consistent with uh, those studies with air temperatures in, in Beijing. Finally, I want to briefly mention local climate zone mappings and assessments. This is probably the studies is more relevant to the people working in urban planning and the, in the urban studies. So one of the important thing is that the urban area has a very different, very different uh, structures, surface structures, and land covers, construction materials, and human activities. So how to standardize the characters of urban morphologies that become a key issues in the land surface temperature, uh, or we say surface urban heat island studies. So. Uh, we use the local climate zone concepts to classify these, uh, the, the different urban surfaces into different types. So as you can see that here, so we have the code of land, uh, local climate zone, so from, okay, for different types. And each local climate zone has a different parameters, so including parameters of sky view factors, aspect ratio, building surface fraction. This we call geometric features. And terrain roughness. And also the surface covers. And all of these kind of parameters we can derive from the remote sensing technique or the GIS technique. Our studies here is in three cities in Texas in the United States. And one is Dallas for wind, one is Austin, one is San Antonio. So this is the three major cities, pretty hot and humid during the summertime because it's in Texas. And so in our, the GIS-based land local climate zone classifications, we using the data LIDAR because LIDAR can provide the elevation data and which is very important for the local climate zone study. So first, we want to develop the local climate zone classification methods and to build local climate zone map for the study areas. And then we assess how the LIDAR data set can be better to the lens, lens cover, uh, lens local climate zone mapping. So this is the, the land cover map. This map we get it from National Land Cover Database, which is developed by United States Geological Survey. And you can see that these are the different attributes, okay, correspond to local climate zone in the study areas. And secondly, we use LIDAR data, we can derive digital terrain model, digital surface model, and normalize 
uh, digital surface models. And so you can see that for the three cities here. And so, and this is the, the building who prints from the urban planning institutes for the urban for three cities. So when we combine together this kind of complicated flow charts, combine them together to become local climate zone. So this is, is the local climate zone in the three cities. So to the right, you can see the corresponding example for each of these local climate zones. So what what is this look like in in the reality? So this okay. So the first you saw in that this we saw in the local climate zone one, four and nine okay in Dallas, and the second one here is showing that for for Austin these cities okay one four and nine and finally we have this showing that in San Antonio so as you can see that here although we use the same local climate zones but in three cities there are some difference so we will discuss this later about these issues so then we can we can apply lens surface temperature, which is derived from the lens set imageries, to associate with local climate zones. So we found that for each local climate zone, lens lens surface temperature is a different. Of course, it's a difference, and due to these different lens covers and the urban structure morphologies. Okay, and we also found the lens surface temperature variations among local climate zones in due to different uh, building densities, okay? So not only the lane cover, lane use lane cover type, but also the building densities. And of course, between different, between these three cities, although there are cons consistencies between these three cities, but there are also some difference. So, so the next thing we want to know that is that the among these three cities, if between these each corresponding link link uh, link uh, uh, the the local climate zone, if they are heating and cooling uh, effect or the surface urban heat island mechanism, if they are similar. So through our study, we found that the patterns are similar. Okay, so we developed an index here called DI, distribution index, to calculate the difference between these three cities. So as you can see that from here, the the figures at the lower right, we can see that this, in these three cities, for each local climate zones, they are quite consistent, except for a few local climate zones. So through this, so we know that the LIDAR data so the, it could be uh, very useful and actually providing uh, an important means to map local climate zones. And further, we can use these local climate zones to relate to the length of the temperature so that we will be able to surf, to compare, to investigate the surface urban heat islands in different cities, in different time locations. Okay. So this is uh, all my presentations. Thank you for everyone.